This project has everything. We have spinning, weaving, an incredible historic textile, true crime. This project started with some wool because most of my projects start that way, like all of my projects. <laughs> and it finished with this piece of cloth that I spun and wove to replicate the structure, the fabric pattern of this historic textile. This is the Jirum cloak. It is housed in the Swedish History Museum and we're gonna talk about that more in just a moment. If you are new to my channel, welcome. I'm Evie. I spin yarn, I weave yarn, and apparently today we're also recreating some historic cloth as well. But we can't make cloth until we spin the yarn, so let's start with the spinning. I spun this wool, which is a blend of Gotland and Moreno wool with a little silk sprinkled in there. Um, I spun this blend on my Ashford spinning wheel using a long draw spinning technique. The cloak that is the inspiration for this project, uh, it looks very, very brown at this point because it spent 2000 years in a bog. <laughs> but the original, it seems to uh, be that it was brown and white. I am using gray and white, which is not um, exact, but sheep come in natural gray colors. And so I think it's very reasonable to assume that if people were able to spin and weave a brown and white pattern, they could also have done the same pattern in a gray and white. So we're close. Ish. After I spun the yarn, I used a center pull ball to ply the yarn. I was a little concerned about having leftovers. Um, I started this whole project with only eight ounces of wool in all, so I didn't want to waste any, any little bit of it. Um, clearly I didn't need to worry because I did end up with some leftover extra. That's fine. It'll work its way into another project someday. The original cloak was spun and woven with a singles yarn, but it's interesting because the edges where the cloak was cut out into an oval shape, those edges had a stitching thread that was a two-ply yarn. So plying was a thing at the time, but it was not done in the actual cloth itself. However, with my two-ply yarn, I was able to match the diameter of the original singles yarn that was used to weave the cloak. I want to talk about this pattern for just a moment, this this hound's tooth pattern. It's sort of a checked pattern, uh, but the if the squares got sort of smeared, they have this little line coming off of them. This is a tessellating pattern, which means the shape is repeated over and over again. Um, and that little, that little bit that comes off of it is supposed to be like a hound's tooth. Uh, so that's why the pattern is called Hound's Tooth. I'm not sure if I see it. Um, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. Do you see a, a Hound's Tooth in there somewhere? I don't know. <laughs> but this is the structure, the pattern of the original cloak. A Hound's Tooth pattern is set up with four threads of two colors that repeat across the warp. So what you'll have is four threads of one color and then four threads of the other color and then four threads of the first color, and then four threads, four threads, four threads, going across the warp. And that is how I set up my weave. Another aspect to this project that layered on the troubleshooting that I had to do to figure out how to do this um, weaving project is that the Hound's Tooth is woven in a 2-2 two -two twill. So if you think about how a plain weave, the basic plain, structure of a weave is going to be over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under, and then it does the opposite on the way back. Um, a two, two, twill is going to go over two, under two, over two, under two, over two, under two, but then it's going to shift over a thread and start the over two, under two, over two, over, under two again. And then on the way back, it's going to shift over a thread again. And so what happens is we create this surface texture, this raised diagonal line that runs the surface of the fabric. And that is what we refer to as a twill weave. This is a cotton table runner that I wove um, and I did use a twill pattern. So I think you can see, I wanted to show you, you can see very clearly 
how a twill weave gives that diagonal pattern in the cloth. Twill can have a lot of variations. In the original Jerome cloak, you can see a variation because they actually zigzagged, so they went one direction, then the other direction, then the other direction. There's a lot of variations on twill. So for, for my project here, I had to keep it simple. I didn't do the zigzag twill, I just did a plain 2-2 diagonal twill. But in the future, I definitely would like to get fancy with my twill. This is the loom that I used for this project. This is my 32 inch wide Kromsky rigid heddle loom. No one knows for sure exactly what type or style or shape of loom the Jerome cloak was woven on, but here is something interesting. It was probably not a warp weighted loom. In the analysis of the cloak, it showed that the warp threads on the end of the cloak actually folded around, which indicates that it might have been more likely to have been woven on a continuous warp Cool, isn't that cool? I find that fascinating. <laughs> There's an article, I do have links for all of the sources and the information um, that I used to research this video. I learned so much from the museum that has this cloak. So a huge thank you to the people doing the amazing research and putting up stuff that is so specific that I could get the numbers and measurements to re recreate this in, in my own way. Um, and so a huge thank you to them, but I do have links and sources for all of that go check them out and especially if you're interested in ancient weaving techniques check out the article I have linked below um, explaining how they are determining what type of loom the cloak may have been woven on and so since we don't have the original loom to weave this on I have to work with the equipment that I do have and so I chose to use my Kromsky rigid heddle loom but it presented a few problems for me, particularly because of the twill. This is the reed, or the rigid heddle. When you put a warp on this type of loom, you're going to put, typically it would be one thread through the slot and one thread through the eye, one thread through the slot and one thread through the eye going across. But um, I needed four threads and so I thought, hmm, I will put two threads of one color in the slot and then two threads of a color in the eye. That was great for me because the way that we are doing our over two under two means that we have four different sheds. That's when the warp threads are spread apart so that we can put our weft through. To create a two-two twill pattern, we have to have four different sheds. Um, if this is four threads of one color, we're gonna have a shed where the first two are lifted. The next one is going to be the next two lifted, <laughs> then the next two lifted, and then the next two lifted going on across. So my rigid haddle was great having two threads in each eye and each slot because that meant I could get this shed by raising the haddle and I could get this shed by lowering the haddle. But what about this one and this one? Well, that was my problem because one of those threads that I needed to lift up was in the eye. And if you try and lift that from the back, the eye of the heddle holds it in place. You can't lift it from the back. So what do we do? How can we create a 2 2 twill on a rigid heddle loom when we can't lift that thread? We have to keep the front of the rigid heddle open without anything in the way because the rigid heddle is also the beater. We lift it up and slide it forward to pack that weft in there for our cloth. But why? Wait, does this have to be the beater for the loom? Once I realized that this does not have to be the beater, it completely solved my problem. I was able to create a 2 2 twill on the rigid heddle loom by adding two string heddles in front of the rigid heddle. I could use those string heddles to lift the threads, even the ones in the eye, and the heddle was not hindering that shed from opening. And I just used a comb pick to beat down that weft and create my fabric. If you've been watching my channel for a little while, you might be saying, but Evie, what about Bertha? 
And yes, Bertha, my four shaft, six treadle, giant floor loom is perfect for twill. Uh, that's what I use to weave that table runner. She loves twill. She will weave twill, all the variations, all day long. Bertha's perfect for twill. But <laughs> Mark has finally started weaving and his rag rug projects are on Bertha currently as we speak, but we will be using her in the future. Let's talk about the Jerem cloak for a minute. It has a history, a cloak and dagger history. This cloak was discovered in the 1920s in a bog on Jerem Mountain in the county of Vassar, Gotland, Sweden. When it was discovered, the cloak was all folded up with three stones about the size of a computer mouse placed on top of it. They retrieved it from the bog and they unfolded it and put it on because you could do that with your archeological finds at that time, I guess. When they discovered this cloak, they unfolded it and discovered a bunch of cuts in the cloak. And these cuts weren't made from it sitting in the bog for 2000 years and it wasn't from the shovel. There was damage from the shovel, but this wasn't that. Uh, so they tried to figure out what these could mean, what, what caused these gashes in this cloth to have occurred. And they put it on like a cloak and they, they made some cardboard daggers to test and see if maybe these gashes in the cloak had been caused by someone attacking the cloak wearer, maybe with a bronze dagger. The Swedish National Laboratory of Forensic Science got to come and take a look at this cloak and test it with forensic analysis, modern analysis, to figure out if this is indeed what had happened, what caused these cuts in the cloak. And they, they concurred, yes, in fact, if someone had been wearing this cloak at the time, they would have been struck in the chest, abdomen, spine, and neck, and probably mortally wounded, which is really sad for the wearer, um, and also for the cloak, because it got cut up in the process. But if that's the case, where's the body? It wasn't found in the bog. And why was the cloak neatly folded up? What was the significance of those three stones? Was it to hold the cloak down in the bog or did it have some other meaning? There are some mysteries that I guess we'll just never know the answer to. After weaving about halfway through this uh, scarf, this piece of cloth I created here, I decided that, well, yes, it is possible to create a hound's tooth two-two twill pattern with a rigid huddle loom using string heddles. It's just kind of fussy <laughs> and a little time consuming. And there was another pattern that I wanted to try out. This pattern is called puppy tooth. It's a simpler pattern than the traditional hound's tooth, and it's much easier to weave a puppy tooth pattern with a rigid huddle loom. So if you'd like to try weaving and, and get that hound's tooth look, but you don't want to fuss around with the string heddles, this is how you can create that look with a rigid heddle loom and only one heddle. Puppy tooth is the same setup, but instead of doing four threads for each grouping of color and four passes with each colored shuttle, um, it would have two threads and then again, two passes with each colored shuttle. I treated the two threads that were going through the eye of the um, reed, I treated those as if they were one thread. And then I did the same for the thread in the slot. And so essentially that now created one thicker, twice as thick thread in the hole and uh, twice as thick thread in the slot. And then to weave the puppy tooth pattern, I used a plain weave. I did not have to worry about the twill. And so all I needed for the plain weave was up and down. <laughs> Those are my two, my two sheds. I doubled the thickness of the threads on my stick shuttles and then I would weave back and forth with one color and then back and forth with the other color rather than weaving back and forth back and forth with one color and back and forth back and forth with the other color. So I kind of, I doubled the thickness but I cut the weaving in half. 
and it it did it go it went much faster I was able to finish that section in a day instead of three <laughs> like it took for the houndstooth I finished both of the ends of my weaving with a simple basic hem stitch and then I just cut it off the loom and it seems like the lesson I have to learn every time I weave something is not to judge it until it's washed and fold because I always judge it too soon and I think this is terrible what what is going on and then I wash it and I'm like oh, it's gorgeous I can't believe I made this so don't judge your projects too soon don't judge your project on the loom <laughs> wash it first and then decide <laughs> so yes it came out uh, much better than I thought it would um, definitely learned a lot doing this project when we put these side by side we can see the difference between the hound's tooth over here which is a little bit more of a complex pattern there's a little more detail in the threads there and then the puppy tooth which is a little bit of a simpler pattern it looks like someone took the hound's tooth and made it just like like more pixelated <laughs> with uh, less detail but from a distance it really does give the same effect um, and unless someone was a weaver or really into cloth um, and really looking closely at my scarf I think I can wear this and no one's really um, going to notice uh, that it's different on one side than the other side the houndstooth section is a little bit thinner than the puppy tooth section. Um, so I wanted to show you the drape on this section, how this fabric just hangs and drapes. It's really lovely. I'm so, so pleased with how this fabric feels, how this hangs. Um, I think it's really pretty. The most exciting part of this project happened at the end because I took a picture of my cloth with a ruler laid out on it to show the scale and then I found a picture of the Jerome cloak fabric up close with a ruler next to it showing centimeters for scale and using my photo editing program I took both of the pictures and matched them up so the scale is exactly the same and I overlaid my picture of my fabric on top of the Jerome cloak fabric and you can see how the pattern in my cloth is exactly the same size I believe that cloak has about seven and a half threads per centimeter I got seven and a half threads per centimeter which I I truthfully was not expecting to get that close to what the original was I would like to do more houndstooth weaving and more um, just variations with this fabric it was so much fun maybe once I have Bertha back to myself she has a 50 inch weaving width and so that's wide enough that I could actually do a bolt of cloth that I could cut up and sew something out of maybe make a houndstooth jacket that would be a great project so if you enjoyed this project and you want to see more, make sure that you subscribe if you'd like to financially support my channel. I have a Patreon as well as buy me a coffee and you'll find that in the description of the video down below. Thank you all so much for joining me on this incredible journey of a project. It was so much fun. I am off to go card some wool because I have more history to discover. See you next time. Happy spinning.